in this particular age, they're talking about cutting the research budgets. And when you cut down from 100 million, you're going down to even less than spitting in the ocean, which brings us to this whole evidence-based approach, which of course requires evidence, which requires research, requires money. And we come back to the, the critical thing that you guys mentioned earlier. It's a, this diagnosis is often not made. And when it's made, it's made late. A, why? And then B, what does this do to your ability to manage this at all? Well, it's not on people's radar, as, but we're really working hard, as Byron just said, and we had with uh, the COPD Foundation and uh, NIH, we were, I can remember, participating in minor league baseball games and screening people. Oh, yeah. And I think the thing that's really pushing it is now Big Pharma is advertising COPD drugs on television. So Byron nicely told us about the effects of nihilism, you know, and what drives patients into the, see the doctors is they're a therapy. So yes, for years it was very, very delayed. People get sedentary for all the reasons that we've heard and assume that the shortness of breath is uh, in middle age getting old and obese. But now because there are effective therapies, not great, but they're effective, uh, that's driving people in and I think that'll move people along. But traditionally, the last thing that doctors thought of was uh, COPD. Cardiologists send me more patients than anybody else. Cardiologists have run some of the big trials like the Summit trial, because the, the cardiologists have, are integral with the deaths due to heart disease. And yeah. same with the pulmonary docs need to learn a little cardiology. <laughs> and so we treat our patients appropriately. But yep. nobody gets to a cardiologist unless he or she is referred in all likelihood. Right. Same with a pulmonologist. So what, first of all, in terms of the diagnosis here, can a, can a primary care physician make this diagnosis? Yes. And if so, how easy is it? Well, I'll start off, and I'd like to hear everybody else uh, chime in, but I think if you think about the cardinal symptoms, you know, of, uh, of COPD with dyspnea getting progressively worse, and then maybe cough, every cough is abnormal, no smokers cough, uh, and, uh, you know, limitations in exercise, those kinds of symptoms. Fatigue is a terrific symptom. And uh, who, would, who, would have, uh, who would have thought about COPD? Because you're, you know, pro appropriately so, looking for diabetes, you're looking for hypothyroid, you're looking for anemia. So I think all those um, uh, things can, uh, can increase the awareness. But I think it's important to remember, uh, to remember that we do have some drugs now for better or worse, and so that I think will ultimately drive in. But we need better screening, and uh, the idea, there's screening, I'm gonna to defer to Byron here to talk about uh, the important role of spirometry in the diagnosis, but somebody has to think about doing it. And, uh, and so often there is no spirometry, yeah, but was, th that's the key thing, and he's developed the tool. Let, let me just ask you for a yeah, okay, I'm gonna get to spirometry in a second, right. but let's be even more basic. Should there be the ability to do spirometry at every primary care doctor's site. Who votes yes? Oh, I mean, I, I think all of us would agree that there should be that capability. Uh, with a, that clearly doesn't take place uh, at this point, Peter. There's no Is question right? about it. Oh, yeah, no. In fact, depending on the studies that you read, even people who've had a diagnosis of COPD who are on some type of, a the of COPD therapy, a quarter have had spirometric testing at some point in life. And so Barry and I have actually spent a lot of time on this, uh, Jim, because... I know you have, both of you, and you've and so developed, developed part, it. Actually, and Frank, part of what you've said actually uh, led to this uh, component. So uh, with, with support of the NHLBI, who's been very supportive in the COPD and National Action right. Plan, I'm a woo -woo, I, on that one as well, um, there, there were uh, a couple of projects that I've been involved in with Byron. So Byron and I have been involved in this for years that actually date back to COPD Foundation and John Walsh and some of the things that John did years ago. And in, when you think about diagnostic components in COPD, the primary care clinician is the key person. They're the person who sees that patient first. And so it would be ideal for that individual to think, okay, you know what, as Jim said, this is old age and shortness of breath and coughing, that is not necessarily a normal thing. And so I think part of what uh, we try to do with the NHLBI, the COPD Foundation, Byron and I have uh, tried to address how could you generate an approach, Peter, that a primary care clinician could easily do that would aid them in making a decision on, you know what, there's probably something going on here. Additional testing is probably warranted. Uh, and so this is this whole capture approach that was an NHLBI initiative that uh, has been going on for several years. Capture is uh, an algorithm. Right? Capture uh, is an algorithm for this uh, very simple approach to, uh, to providing information to the primary care clinician that COPD is likely. 
And so the, the, there are a couple of components that are really interesting how we did this because I think it's very instructive for the primary care clinician. Primary care clinicians were involved in the development of this whole process. And so when we asked them, well, you like to vote, so I'm going to have you vote. If, I'm, if, if you're a primary care clinician and I want to give you a very simple approach, simple questions, how many questions do you want? How many questions is practical for you to ask a patient? If, if I'm a primary care? Correct. I want three, four, five. Okay. Jim? Five, three, four, five. Sherba? Same. Uh, ditto. Okay, so, <laughs> so when Byron and I were knows the answer, so he's out of the mix. So when Byron and I were involved in this, we were like, okay, Byron, this is going to be a challenge because these guys only want three to five questions. We've got to come up with three to five questions. But just to stop you, because they got three to five questions for COPD, oh, that's three to five questions for three, prostate. Depression. Three to, pretty soon, they're up to an hour and a half, and they're only getting paid for seven minutes. That's exactly what they said. They said, you know, you've got to be practical. We've got to do all this for a whole series of chronic diseases, all right. of which have therapy, some of which are good, some are not as good. And so we're like, okay. So got five questions, I've got to come up with five questions. And then it was a question, it's a matter of how do you ask these questions? And I always remember Sherba's always saying, you have to ask the questions in relation to what the patient has stopped doing. I just, that's stuck in my mind, Frank, for years. And so throughout this whole process, Peter, we actually came up with a concept. And after a very rigorous approach, came up with an instrument that, guess what, has five questions. <laughs> and I did not know this. It's incredible. And you know what? Some of these questions, Jim, uh, since it was done, and I've, you know, Byron will know this, in a very rigorous fashion, it involved patients from the beginning. It is right. a very complex data set. I mean, it was this whole rigmarole that we did for this thing. Uh, and I learned a lot about how you asked questions. And so, Frank, it was very clear, something that you've said for 20 years came up in, these, uh, in this instrument, and that is, you can't just ask, are you short of breath? The, the question has to be, are you short of breath with this activity, and are you doing less? Absolutely, for sure. Right. Jim. Another item that came up that I, would, I was surprised in seeing, fatigue. Right. Completely integral. integral. And it was like a key question. The other one, if you remember, John Walsh was very clear in this as well, was seasonal change in symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and John, who was the head of the COPD Foundation for years, who actually had severe COPD, as he looked at that question, he said, yes, that's exactly right. Nobody ever asked that question. And so we ended up with five really simple questions. And Frank, a peak flow meter, something that primary care clinicians do all the time. Right. It's very cheap. They know how to do it. And you know what? Peter, it looks really good in identifying so people that have likely have COPD. Is that what CAPTURE is about? That's what CAPTURE is about. And, and, and uh, Byron and I are just literally this week starting a large validation study across 85 primary wow. care centers across good, the U.S. Good. With the NHLBI. This is an NHLBI COPD foundation initiative. So the only thing that I would stress uh, is that the questionnaire that, and, and I know Fernando was involved in developing a number of other questionnaires in the past. None of them were really developed with this degree of, of structure to them. But it's really interesting because the, most of the prior questionnaires basically found old active or former smokers. The question, do you smoke, did you smoke, didn't even make the yes. cut here. Amazing. Uh, which is really fascinating that is, that's, because that it is may really give us the amazing. first chance of finding some of the 20, 25 percent of people with COPD more around the world, as Jim said, who never smoked at all. And it's not uh, pejorative. No. Oh, it's very worded to not be pejorative. I got so it. So it's really, and it's been checked out, and we've already validated or we've actually gone through the process of doing it in Spanish. And the hope is that this validation study uh, will lead to a real change. But I, I do want to stress one other thing, and I'm interested in Frank's comments about this. Uh, the goal of this from the beginning was to better determine who primary care should send for spirometry. Correct. And that remains the goal, Correct. I understand that. But it's interesting because, uh, because you can have patients in primary care who have symptoms classic for COPD, who don't meet your classic spirometry criteria for having COPD, but they may have a lot of COPD on their CAT scans. The question really is, ultimately, is spirometry the best answer for this, or is it only one piece of a puzzle that ultimately, for us to make a difference, we need to move on from?